Welcome to Dodgers Daily. I'm Casey Porter. I'm so glad that you decided to tune in. Join for the Dodgers Daily Mailbag, as I am each and every Monday, by Austin Brubaker. So, Austin, I guess it's not Monday. It's Tuesday morning. But, hey, we did get to the mailbag. There was hurricanes over the weekend in Southern California. I got a new dog, so things got kind of crazy. There were no games in the system at all on Monday. The Dodgers didn't play on Sunday, so we're releasing this Tuesday morning. Yeah, obviously, thinking for the people in California, want to make sure that everybody is safe over there. Uh, our thoughts were with you as you're going through uh, everything that's going on in California. But we saw over the weekend, we saw Dodgers, a couple of games Friday, and then doubleheader on Saturday, rare doubleheader for the Dodgers, a little bit of a mixed bag stinker on Friday, and then you had a couple of wins against a team that is in the hunt for the playoffs in the Marlins on Saturday. So lots lots of action over the weekend, even though two consecutive days without Dodgers baseball, it kind of feels like an eternity. Yeah, it does, especially this time of year, and especially as well as the Dodgers I've been playing. Man, when you're playing this well, you don't want days off. I mean, you just want to keep mm-hmm. rolling. Yeah, no, that is for sure. Any sort of length of delay, especially when you're as hot as you are, can cool you down. Uh, So we'll have to see how the Dodgers come out against the Cleveland team uh, coming up, uh, I guess, tonight uh, when this video comes out. Yep, no doubt about it. Okay, so just a reminder, we will have our mailbag here in just a minute. Going to talk about a little bit of the action over the weekend before we get to it. Also a reminder that we are open for business. If you you have a business or if you know somebody who would like to sponsor this Dodgers Daily Show, the Dodgers Dog Show, or anything we do on DodgersDaily.net or the social media platforms, if you would like to sponsor or you know somebody who would, just DM me, leave a comment, or you can email me at DodgersDaily73 at DodgersDaily73 at gmail.com. Also, don't forget to like this video, leave a comment, interact with this video, and don't forget to turn your notifications on. Okay, so just overall thoughts of the action at the Major League level this weekend. Yeah, no, uh, obviously we saw Tony Gonsolin really struggle. And then following that, we saw him go down with some sort of injury that's looking like it's going to be a sustained injury, at least for the course of this season. Uh, But then the Dodgers responded after their winning streak was snapped and they lost pretty bad. They came out in the doubleheader and they grinded out a couple of wins against some really good pitching that the Marlins were able to produce. Uh, You saw the Dodgers grind them out. You saw some good pitching performances from the Dodgers. Uh, So you like to see how they respond from a game that was a little bit disappointing. They came out and really showed an answer and some resiliency in that doubleheader. You know, the Dodgers are 76 and 47. So, uh, you know, they're on pace to win somewhere around, you know, high 90s. Maybe 100 games there. 11 and a half over the Giants, 13 over the D-backs, 18 over the Padres. What has impressed you the most about this team? Yeah, I, I think it's been their ability to take in a whole bunch of different new pieces, take in some veterans, some younger guys, be able to struggle and then be able to pull away. They We saw over the course of this season just their competitiveness, just some of their resiliency. It hasn't always been the prettiest. There has been times where we've questioned uh, this team, but they've always been able to respond and show that they are still the 100 win Dodger team or close to 100 win Dodgers teams, the kings of the NL West, at least to this point right now. Um, they've shown some extreme resiliency throughout the course of this season. It's been a little bit of a dis- different story, especially compared to last year when they were so far ahead throughout the entire season. We've seen just this, just the character of this team really develop. That's what's been most impressed to me. Yeah, no doubt about it. I would agree with all that. Okay, so Friday night, I'm thinking, hey, you know, Tony Gonsolin might not make the postseason roster if he keeps pitching like this. And I mean that in all sincerity, and I don't mean that to be negative towards anything. Hey, Major League Baseball, it's a competitive world, man. I mean, you either produce or, or you know, or you don't get a spot on certain rosters, especially in an organization like the Dodgers. When you got a guy like Emmett Sheehan who's thrown the way that he has and he continues just to dominate at the AAA level, when you see a guy like Ryan Pepio come up and throw as well as he has, Bobby Miller, all these guys, you know, so I'm thinking, okay, well, Gonsolin might not even make the postseason roster if he doesn't get some things figured out. Then the next thing you know, 
he comes on he, he, we find out that there's there's issues injury wise and man it's just been tough for him because it just seems like every time in his career he's had a chance to build some momentum like off of last year it gets halted via via the injury he's been injured a lot yeah it's been it's been disappointing i know especially for him dealing with some of these injuries last year when he was extremely effective we saw dominance early in the season but then we see some of the injuries kind of derail a lot of that and i think that's been the biggest frustration and the biggest concern for Gonsolin has had he's had to deal with a whole bunch of different injuries and now this one to derail this season especially after a real disappointing start where he gave yep. up 10 runs or so to Miami um just really disappointing to see that uh you hope that he's able to recover be able to get to his full and healthy self because he's shown that he can be a really effective and dominant yep. pitcher when he is healthy the issue is we just haven't seen that consistency it could be dealing with some sort of ramifications of past injuries or dealing mm -hmm. with some injuries that he's been trying to fight through see this is exactly why the dodgers were 100 percent correct for fighting him in arbitration in the offseason it's also exactly why tony gonsolin was 100 percent correct to not want the dodgers and you know to to think they shouldn't be be you know questioning him in that or, or challenging him on that because the Dodgers hey man they want to see a track record they they were they were fighting that based over a track record that they didn't have this is an organization that likes data as well as anybody else they didn't feel like they had the, the a long enough period of time of data to to you know not go not fight the arbitration numbers so I thought that situation kind of played out exactly like it should have and I think this season has shown that yeah, no, I think you've seen kind of both sides of that. We've seen the success that Tony Gonsolin can have. The yeah. question for the Dodgers is, can that su success be sustained yeah. over a long period of time? And unfortunately, we've seen some of the injuries with that that have derailed uh, that situation. So you've seen a little bit of both, which I think kind of has led to some of the disagreements in the arbitration process. Yep. Okay. So Tony Gonsolin out. Ryan Pepio in. Of course, Ryan Pepio got optioned yesterday. Not a big deal. I think you know, in, in doubleheader situations, you get an extra roster spot. Anyways, he took that roster spot. So back down he goes. Not a big deal. Okay. He's got to stay down. I think like ten days in the minor leagues. He can come back. He has plenty of options left. He will be back at the major league level. This is that's not a, a, a demotion to say hey. Thank you for your services. We'll see you next year. That's that's not what they did to Ryan Pepio. He will be back up again this year. I promise you. He's been pitching too well. He's worked way too hard in the in the in his rehab to get back. And that slider looked too good. So tell me what you thought about Ryan Pepio. Yeah, we saw a really good outing for him uh, over the weekend and against Miami. And yeah, you're absolutely right. He will be back. And I think he's probably going to be back as part of those September call-ups mm -hmm. that you get. You get two extra roster spots, I believe position player and a pitcher. I think Ryan Pepio is going to be one of those pitchers, especially with the injury to Gonsolin going down. Uh, but we saw the effectiveness that he's had, not just at the major league level, also at the minor league level. It, pretty obvious that we saw one of his most recent starts where he was perfect through six innings uh, and then we saw this outing work just effective against a Miami lineup that put up 10 runs the previous game on the Dodgers pitching staff uh, he will be back he's going to have an important role down the stretch and he's going to have the opportunity to fight for a potential postseason spot I don't know if he's going to get it but he's going to have the opportunity to fight for it and if he's hot they might have a spot for him yeah, I, I think he's going to make a postseason roster. I, I mean, I think his stuff is too good. It's too diverse. That slider. You know, the thing about it last year is we heard about the changeup, and the changeup is fantastic. They made some adjustments to it in the offseason, and they took a little bit of the right turn away from it and added, you know, just, just made it more of a tumbling-type pitch, which makes it easier to, to control. You know, if your pitch is moving in two different directions, if it's moving right and down, that's an extremely difficult pitch to control. So if you eliminate one of the movements and then now you can just predict, okay, how far is it going to drop? That makes it a little bit easier to control and keep in the strike zone. And then the second thing they did with him in the offseason is that they gave him different shapes to a slider. That's what we saw on Saturday. He has the smaller slider, the cutterish type pitch, the smaller. And, and not only does he have a smaller slider, 
he has a smaller left turn slider. Then he has a smaller slider that has depth. And then he has the bigger slider in both of those type shapes. So really that slider was playing like four different pitches as far as, you know, you have the small left turn, you have the big left turn, you have the small depth, you have the big depth. And he was able to do all of that while still uh, uh, throwing enough strikes to only walk one guy. The slider was a big time pitch. The fastball reached 95, and he always has the changeup. So very, very, very skilled, very impressive from Ryan Pepio. Yeah, very impressive. And those that slider, having those different movements, the different uh, shapes to it, uh, gets a lot of swings and misses. And that's what we saw on mm-hmm. Saturday, just being able to get batters to swing and miss. And if he's able to control, uh, keep it in the strike zone a little bit, we saw only one walk on Saturday. He's going to be extremely effective, and I think continue to work on that, continuing to make those strides, those improvements, uh, is going to keep him on the major league team. 75 pitches, 49 strikes. So, you know, that's not like – he's not like he's throwing a strike 90% of the time. It's almost like he's throwing just enough to be effective Mm -hmm. where the hitter just can't tee off, I'm going to ambush him. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and you don't want necessarily to throw 100% strikes unless yeah. they're swinging and missing every single time. You want to get them to swing and miss at some pitches outside the zone. You want to sneak in a couple of strikes, too. Obviously, you don't want to walk everybody. That's not the goal of the at-bat. That's something negative that can happen. But still, if you have that effective mix, if you're able to get some swings and misses outside of the zone, if you're able to generate weak contact inside the zone, Yep. and have that effective mix, effective mix, I think you can be a really effective pitcher. And I think Ryan Pepio was able to find that consistency, find that mix on Saturday. No doubt. Five innings, one run, five strikeouts, just the one walk we mentioned, just three hits, 75 pitches, 49 strikes. Okay. His changeup had the movement of 36 inches of vertical drop, 17 inches of horizontal, so not as much horizontal as it's had in the past. So Ryan Pepio, very, very, very good. Also, his spin on its four seam got over 2,400 at its max, and anything over 2,300 is very good as far as riding the top of the zone. So everything that Ryan Pepio did Saturday was simply fantastic. So, hey, any more thoughts about the Major League Club before we get to our mailbag? They're still playing some good baseball, and I was ha- happy to see that resilient, uh, hoping that continues moving forward even after this couple-day break. All right, fans, it's time for the Dodgers Daily Tuesday Mailbag. All right, fans, it's time for the Dodgers Daily Mailbag. The first question that was sent in, a very good one. Austin, should the Dodgers – boy, this is one that, that I'm going to like – Okay, should the Dodgers pick up Lance Lynn's $18 million option for next year? $18 million is a chunk of change. Uh, you know, but and the way that he pitched earlier this year, you wouldn't think so, but since the since he's become a Dodger, he's pitched very well. Boy, that's a great question. $18 million, Lance Lynn, do you pick that up? Yeah, and that that is a really good question. I think I think Lance Lynn's going to have the opportunity to prove himself even more if he's able to continue like he pitches down the stretch. I think you have to seriously consider that. Um, you also have to wonder if this is kind of what his peak is going to be for yeah. the remainder of his career too because he's getting up there in age he is 36 right now he'll be 37 next year will he be worth that 18 million dollars or would you rather use those resources to mm-hmm. keep some of the other free agents starting pitching i think you i think it's going to be a really good question i think it's going to depend on who the dodgers want to keep from their pitching staff because you're going to have kershaw you're going to have urias and you're going to have lynn come off the books next year i think you have to keep at least one of those guys it depends on who you want to target and i think lance lynn has the opportunity to make a name continue to make a name for himself in los angeles but i won't immediately pull on the trigger on that quite yet yeah, well, and the thing is, Tyler Anderson, Andrew Heaney, Chris Martin, these guys, typically speaking, they, the Dodgers know that it's tough for these guys that, that have shown, you know, you know, 
the the cracks in their game, if you will, it's tough for them to do it back to back years, especially late in their careers. So the Dodgers, I think, are going to see this as just kind of striking gold, the right place at the right time for Lance Lynn. Eighteen million dollars being a lot, you would bet on him next year. You know, either not being healthy or certainly not pitching the way he is. Just the way the Dodgers, it seems like to me, have done business in the past. I think it would probably favor and probably somewhat heavily they wouldn't exercise his option just because I think they think the, they would think the odds of a 37-year-old duplicating what he's doing right now would be – those odds would be long. Yeah, and I think you have to weigh the risk. Again, free agency is all about predicting what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, you not the to, past. Great yes, point. Yes, you, ha- you, ha- you can't be playing paying players for what they've done previously. You have to go into the expectation of what they're going to do in the future. Otherwise, yeah, you'll be you way behind. what you think they're going to do. Yes, and I think with this, um, I think it becomes a little bit complicated. One, with his age, this is not anything against Lance Lynn, who has been yeah. phenomenal of a pitcher, and I think he's going to get some sort of contract. Whether I think it's probably going to be a one-year deal just with his age. Could be a two-year deal that he's worked out somewhere. Very well could be with the Dodgers at a restructured contract. Yeah. Um, but the Dodgers do have Good a point. ton of depth with their pitching as far as it, the upper minors uh, coming up. We're going to see some of these arms, especially heavily on the right-handed side too, uh, that could play a factor. You want to get some more starts to Bobby Miller and Emmett Sheehan, Ryan Pepio, yeah. uh, throw in Michael Grove in there as well. All yeah. of these different guys. Nick I think Rasso, that's Landon yeah, Nick Ra- Oh, yeah. All the Gavin guys. Gavin Stone. Gavin Stone. You're going to be seeing – potentially a guy like a Kyle Hurt, who if you look at some of his numbers, Kyle his Hurt. swinging miss numbers, I uh, p- p- retweeted something on Twitter. It's unreal what he's doing at the minor yeah. league level. Um, all of these guys are coming up. And so I think that makes it a little bit complicated to just assume the Dodgers are going to pick up that $18 million option. I think Lance Lynn has the opportunity to prove himself, though, to make it so that the Dodgers want to do that. I think the Dodgers are a little bit disciplined in that where they are good way uh, to put it where they might not see they might see the risk as being too much and let lance land get an opportunity to continue to prove himself elsewhere that would at least be my expectation right now yeah i think we're both on the same page i think we would both probably lean on a no on that you know just for the like you said, just the just the future prediction of it. It's just so hard for these guys to do to duplicate great results back to back, you know. So and the Dodgers are very disciplined. That's that's a great way to put it, Austin. Okay, so mailbag question number two. The Dodgers, we all know, are very loaded with pitching prospects, but what do you see throughout the system that you think needs improved in terms of pitching in the minor league system? Yeah, and this is a really good one. We obviously you and I both get to see a lot of the Dodgers pitching and we get to see some of their philosophy as far as how they go about acquiring pitching talent. And one of the things that the Dodgers do particularly well is they get a lot of pitchers that have incredible stuff. Yeah. We've seen throughout the minor leagues guys with insane velocities. You look at a guy, I'm going to use Great Lakes as an example. You look at guys like Carlos De Los Santos throwing 100, 101 miles per hour with insane velocities. You see some wicked movement on a lot of these pitches. Uh, All of these different guys. One of the things that the Dodgers and in their farm system that I've that is pretty noticeable is they do struggle a little bit with some of their command. Um, And you see this generating a lot of walks. Um, That could be very much something that the Dodgers try to look at potentially acquiring some guys maybe with a little bit of more command over those swing and miss type stuff i'm not saying completely change your philosophy at all but more of adding maybe a little bit of balance to that as well working with a whole bunch of different guys obviously you want those guys that can throw a bunch of strikes get a bunch of swings and misses but maybe you can have some of those guys that don't walk 
as many guys, guys like it more in the mold of an Aldria Costa who's able yeah. to get some of those, maybe not necessarily swings and miss, but also doesn't walk a bunch of guys, gets some weak contact. Some of those guys just scattered throughout the system, I think would add a little bit more of a variety. And I think with the Dodgers coaching staff that they have in the minor leagues, their pitching staffs, I think they'd be able to work with those guys really well and just be able to continue to motivate them to teach and work with a whole variety of different guys. 100%. You said that so perfectly. And the way that I would I the thing I would compare that to is like hey, the 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 toolsy power type hitters, you know that the Dodgers like to get like a Jose Ramos but that strikes out a whole lot. Hey, you know, that's okay. Those guys are toolsy. They have all this time in the minor league system to figure out the swing and miss, to continue adding to the power while while trying to hit the ball a little bit more and striking out a little bit less, of which Jose Ramos, James Altman's the same type of guy. They've typically done that as they've gone on. So, hey, you know, so let's not get, you know, just every single player that's a strikeout, home run, walk guy, a three-outcome type of guy. Let's also sprinkle in a Kendall George. Let's sprinkle in a Jake Vogel. Let's sprinkle in some of these guys that could be high-contact, speed type of guys. I'm not saying – you need to start filling all your rosters out with them. But like you said, just at least, hey, maybe two or three of them on a roster where you're sprinkling them in and having that balance. I think definitely you hit the nail on the head. The Dodgers, they like going for the toolsy type of guys with the big fastballs. I think if you look up and down from Rancho Cucamonga all the way to AAA Oklahoma City, the one thing that the Dodgers don't do enough of at the minor league level is throw strikes, and it doesn't matter if you throw 300 miles an hour if the ball is not in the strike zone, especially with automated strike zone systems coming. If you're not throwing the ball in the strike zone, it doesn't matter what tools you have. You're not going to get outs. I think we would probably both agree, too, Austin. The second thing that they have to start doing, they have to start holding base runners on better. If you watch Tulsa play, they give up more stolen bases than any team in the Texas League, and it is not close. So I think, you know, just putting an emphasis on – and I, Diego Cartaya threw a couple runners out a couple, the other day too. I think those two things, put an emphasis on sprinkling some strike throwers in there, get the ball in the strike zone more with the pitchers you have, maybe reduce the miles an hour and the movement on the pitches to, you know, sacrifice a little bit of that to throw more strikes as we go on with the automated system and hold runners on better and don't give up as many stolen bases. Sure. And I think all of these are kind of secondary aspects that sure. can just just more improve the pitching. We've seen yes. a lot of pitching talent come through the Dodgers system. We've seen their pitching, the way they do pitching does work. We're just trying to think of potentially ideas even to make it even better. And I think adding these different elements, having these be something that they're working on. I know each one of the guys are working on trying to, each one of the pitchers working on trying to limit the stolen bases. Each one of the catchers is working on their throws to second base. We've seen each one of these guys try to work on throwing strikes, working on different stuff. doesn't mean when they're throwing balls that they aren't working on yeah, different right. stuff as well, too, because they might be working on different sequencing. They might be working on yeah. a vari wide variety of different things. All of this is just the aspects that we noticed, some trends that we're seeing throughout the Dodgers system, mm -hmm. some areas that potentially could need some improvement. And if that improvement is made, just can make the team, the pitching depth, even that much better. Mm -hmm. No doubt. And the stolen base thing is mainly on the pitchers, you know, just the delivery to home plate. You know, they're way above the 1.3. Sometimes they're in the 1.8, 1.9 category delivering to home plate. When you do that, there's absolutely no chance for a catcher. Okay, so number three, the question number three, mailbag question number three, we saw that Tony Gonsolin went down on the IL, most likely done for the season. So that being the case, who takes Tony Gonsolin's spot on the postseason roster? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I think we – it, it would be something that I think we could eventually go into kind of who we think is going to be on the postseason roster. Uh, that might be a little bit tricky because you, it very much depends kind of on who's hot, who's healthy at the time. So we're still backed up enough to where we're trying to project it. Yeah. Uh, one guy that we've talked about earlier in the show that has a real opportunity to take that spot is Ryan Pepio. Yeah. 
because of what he's been able to do, because he's finally healthy now, because of the movement that he has on his stuff, being able to get some swings and misses. I think he has a real shot to take a big step and put his name into the hat to potentially make the postseason roster. No doubt. And the thing about that is you don't necessarily, of course, Tony Gonsolin's a starter. But because the way that the TV works and the playoffs, you don't necessarily have to replace his roster spot with a starting pitcher. Mm -hmm. It can be for a guy that can throw in relief as well. So it doesn't have to be a starter. I would have to say that that the first guy, I think you hit the nail on the head there, Austin, is that the guy that would take that spot would be Ryan Pepio. And you're kind of getting your cake and eating it too because we saw Ryan Pepio. He came in after Caleb Ferguson in the piggyback role. So we know that he can come out of the bullpen. We know he can start. We know he can go late innings. He can do all that kind of stuff. And we know that he's very adaptable because, man, he's been on that he's been on that up and down train, that Mitch White train where hey, you're in L.A., you're – You're in Oklahoma City, you're hurt, you know, so he's dealt with every situation. So I would have to think that spot would go to Ryan Pepio. Okay, question number four on our mailbag. With the depth the Dodgers added at the trade deadline, do you think they will go with a platoon in the outfield or do you think they'll just play the guys that are hot or even the infield when you talk about shortstop? Yeah, no. Platoon or the guys that are hot? Uh, so this is, this is a really good question um, as far as platoon versus those who are hot. Uh, I guess it would depend on how hot a guy is hitting. If it, if a guy is hitting just to tear, just tearing the ball up like we're seeing. I mean, obviously, I don't think this is going to happen. But with what Julio Rodriguez is doing in Seattle mm-hmm. right now, going hitting 700 800 in his past 24 plate yeah. appearances of course you got to play that guy uh but i think realistically uh dodgers would probably option for the platoon just because there's a little bit more of a longer track record yeah. as far as you can see kind of okay he hits this versus righties he hits this versus lefties let's go ahead and try to take yeah. care of those matchups but i think you have to have a sense of how you guys are doing and in those moments so i think there could be a situation where guy is just on fire so you're gonna end up playing him every single day if a guy like kike gets on fire he'll be in the lineup every single day uh i think it really depends on on how on fire some of these guys are if not i think you can take advantage of those platoon matchups which you have set up so i think regardless of which one that you go with i think you are in a good environment to do it so kind of what you're saying the rule of thumb is platoon because just because a guy's hot doesn't mean he's hot against left-handers just because a guy's hot doesn't mean he's going to be hot against a, a pitching matchup that might not be good for him or whatever so the rule of thumb is I think the Dodgers are going to platoon unless somebody is just so crazy hot that you just go, hey, what? you know what, put your books down for a minute, going to use my gut here. I'm going to play this guy today even though the, the data and, and analysis tells me not to. Yeah, I think that's I think that's kind of how it goes. You want to have kind of a rule of thumb of how you think things are going to go and you have a little bit more predictability in the platoon yeah type matchups but in the postseason you're dealing with such small sample sizes yeah. guys have very limited time to adjust you also have to take into account that and you have to make those adjustments which calls for some sort of gut decisions yeah. you can't always go straight off the books like we saw in the 2020 world series yeah. taken out Blake Snell for Tampa yeah. and so you have to have a little bit of feel for the game as well a little bit of that balance which is kind of what we've talked about with this okay mailbag question number five these are these are your sweet spot right here Austin has your opinion changed about re-signing Julio Urias now that he is performing better in his and his value is going back up yeah and that and that's a really good question too because I think if we had talked about this about a month ago, back when Julio Arias was really struggling for a little bit, uh, we had talked about potentially, and I don't think this was likely to happen if we had continued struggling, potentially the Dodgers uh, being able to uh, sign him on a short one-term kind of prove-yourself deal. Yeah. Uh, 
that's out of the question now. He's it's re- started to reestablish himself as a frontline starter. Even if he struggles down the stretch, pe- teams are going to see his upside and what he's been able to do, not just through stretches this season, but his track record where he's going to get a good, healthy deal. And especially with this free agent class, which is seen as not quite as good, even yeah. though it does have Shohei Otani, uh, Julio Arias is going to get a good, healthy contract from some team. Now, the question is, do the Dodgers want to go ahead and try to pursue getting Julio Arias, perhaps in addition to taking on a unreal contract with Shohei Otani, which I think we all kind of assume that they are at least going to be pursuing that to some degree. Uh, I think that I think that contract, the Shohei contract, makes it a little bit tricky, but I think you also have to have a frontline starting pitcher to this yeah. staff, whether that is a Kershaw, whether that is in Arias. I think you have to keep one of those two guys. Even if you get Shohei? Even if you get Shohei. I think you have to get one of those two guys because you also have to have some sort of left-handed pitcher on the staff. Uh, unless yeah. there is other some other left-handed pitcher that's going to fit or going to be on the market. I'm assuming they probably won't sign Eduardo Rodriguez, but you never know. Uh, you'd have to look for some sort of left-handed pitcher because the depth of the pitching that they have, at least in the upper levels of the minor leagues, is right-handed heavy based. And so you got to have some sort of starting pitcher or two in the major leagues that is left-handed. It has been Kershaw. It has been Arias for a while. Uh, it's going to get more difficult, even though he's pitching really well, to sign him in the offseason. I think that's a good problem to have because that means he's pitching well right now, though. So you're saying it's going to be Shohei and Julio or Shohei and Kershaw or Julio and Kershaw. Those are the combinations? I, I Is there think, any chance it could be Shohei, Julio, and Kershaw? I think that's, gonna, I think that's where you're going to get – it's going to be extremely difficult to do that, especially with the contract that Shohei is talking is, is yeah. likely to get because the numbers that he's are likely to get are beyond anything that we have ever seen yeah. in the game more than likely. And that's going to just create an enormous difficulty to the point where you might want to get a guy like a Kershaw just because he might be a shorter term yeah. deal. He might be that one year yeah. type of contract like he has been signing um, as opposed to That would to be in Arias. favor of Lance Lynn too. That would be in favor of a guy like a Lance Lynn uh, even though he's a right-handed pitcher. Yeah. Um, I, think th- I think that is perhaps more likely at this point if you go after that obviously if you don't go after a Shohei then that opens up the avenue for Julio which there also is the argument for Julio just because he's so young yeah he has the potential to pitch more even though I don't necessarily look at the age as much as a pitch for pitchers as opposed to hitters. Just because I because I also look at so how many pitches they've thrown over the length of their career yeah. as well. We've seen Julio be able to throw a lot of pitches uh, throughout his career. Even with that, he's going to get a really good contract. Some team is going to pay him. We'll see if the Dodgers end up doing it. Yep, and the thing about it, I, I think that favors him is that. The Dodgers don't have anybody in the system to immediately replace him with from a left-handed perspective. They, they, I mean, Ronan Kopp, Maddox Bruns, Justin Robuski are next three. So, you know, if Clayton Kershaw does move on, I'm not saying that's going to happen. Then, you know, that 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 puts Julio Urias at a very big-time advantageous position against the Dodgers because you just can't – I mean, I guess you can, but it would be tough to have a rotation with, with zero lefties in it. Of course, you could use maybe yeah. Ryan Yarbrough. You, if you could potentially do that, although I like the role that he yeah. has with the Dodgers right now being more situational, more of that piggyback type role. Yeah. Uh, you have to be able to put these guys in the best position that you possibly mm-hmm. can for them to succeed. And so if they're not able to get a Kershaw, if they're not able to get an Arias, you could also see the Dodgers 
try different creative avenues to get left-handed pitching as well. So I don't think they're going to bend over backwards to get Arias just so they have a left-handed starting pitcher. I think they're going to, like we talked about earlier, be smart, Mm -hmm. be disciplined, and try to make the best move they possibly can, not just to win next year, but to win, continue for years in the future. So with the trade deadline, you know, with with the the with the playoffs, there's more teams involved now. It's muddier at the trade deadline, so that it's it's gone into the it's it's basically a seller's market at this point. We saw that big time this year. That hurts a team like the Dodgers that likes to make trades instead of free agency because they'd rather give up prospect capital for the shorter term deals than than give ten year deals. So I would think one of the adjustments the Dodgers will make will be. You know, hey, they're going to be heavier in the trade market in the offseason because that's whenever the the trade market itself will kind of balance itself out, if you will. And I think the Dodgers are going to are, would prefer most scenarios a trade versus a free agency situation because of the contract benefits they would get from it. Yeah, I think long-term contracts handicap you long-term. As far as you're kind of set into this, if things don't work out, it's very difficult to maneuver your way out of that. And I think think those adjustments – trading perhaps a little bit more during the offseason even though you don't necessarily know where your weak spots are going to be yeah. might be the way to go specifically because the price might be a little bit cheaper down then you have certain yep. values throughout your system uh and i think if you're able to get uh some talent back for less while giving up less i think that would probably be uh, a wise thing to do do just so you give up less talent uh i think that could be an adjustment that they make especially because added row season roster spots i think really does change the game quite a bit because i think as you said it muddies the water it makes it a little mm-hmm. bit more difficult to see who is competing who is not uh and especially in the past when we've seen a team like philly be able to make the world series mm-hmm. after in this after in the sixth spot as far as the bracket is concerned in the postseason, mm-hmm. uh, it makes it difficult to tell your fans that, hey, we're not going to buy at the trade deadline when you're extremely close. So I think making those adjustments and learning from, from a lot of the new rules, new formats that baseball has, I think the Dodgers will reevaluate once we get to the offseason and make the appropriate adjustments. I'm so disappointed for you. You go to all these loans games, you're – there in uh where were they at last lansing yep, last week lansing. you were there you went to almost every game the one stinking game you didn't go to griffin lockwood pal hits a cycle and he hits a game-winning home run to complete the cycle and you weren't there yeah it, you know what i'm Ugh. if i'm a lansing yeah. fa- if i'm a lansing lug nut fan i would be ex- and i went to the game on friday i'd be extremely grateful that somebody didn't show up to that game because you know that i would have been <laughs> loud and screaming oh, so you're superstitious <laughs> oh very much superstitious i mean i've already taught you how to do the funky feather oh yeah <laughs> i and i do that i tell fans around me to do that i get the bus driver to go ahead and do the funky feather um and carson taylor that, yeah. Oh, yeah. Get Carson Taylor to do that. Uh, no. And to see that from a guy like from Locke, uh, who has been really amazing over the past month, past month in the month of August, he's got like a WRC plus of 192. Yeah. We saw him hit for the cycle. He got a couple home runs on Sunday as well. He's extremely uh, he's extremely locked in, pardon my pun for that. Uh, Griffin Lockwood Powell uh, hitting for the cycle. Obviously disappointed I missed that, but not disappointed for him because he, all of this hard work that he's put in, being a catcher, being a first baseman, kind of filling a bunch of roles when needed, when rushing mm-hmm. has been down, when Yaner has been dealing with injuries. He's been really reliable, really solid all season. And to see him hit for the cycle, the third cycle in Great Lakes Loons history, really special. Yeah. Were you there the night that Bobby Miller and I believe it was um, 
Oh, oh Texas for, Tech the, guy that, for the no hitter. Uh, Clayton Beater and Cameron Gibbons. Gibbons. Seems like yep. there's one more pitcher they could yeah, buy. There's, for the only there's, one, there's one more that was added to there. I'd have to go back and look. No, they were in Lake County in 2021. Yeah. I was in Hawaii when that was happening. So I missed that one too. Oh, man. Okay. So a, right. a lot of. I, do, I was there for uh, the last cycle the Loons hit when Alex De Jesus hit it in nice. 2022 nice. in mid June. I was there for that one. But nice. these past two, uh, those other two events, totally missed them. And it's some of the rare games that I miss. Final thoughts before we head off to the minor league section of the show. Uh, yeah, no. So just really excited with what the Dodgers are able to do. We've had a lot of different conversations about where the team is right now, where yeah. they could be in the future. Uh, a lot of exciting conversations. We, there's a lot of opportunities over the past, next month or so, even though you think the Dodgers might have this division wrapped up, there's still opportunities for guys to prove themselves. There's opportunities for a guy like Julio Arias to continue to build his values. There's guys younger guys who have the opportunity to establish themselves as be into bigger roles going into mm -hmm. the future uh everything every single game counts yep and you make an impression impression every single game so at the major league side uh excited to see all of these different storylines play out the minor league side excited to see them continue to grow and develop uh, for Loons, only three more weeks left of the regular season. Try to regain some of their footing before they head into the postseason. All right, awesome. We'll see you on Friday morning. Thanks. All right, sounds good. All right, fans, time now to take a trip down on the farm, so let's not waste more time. Let's talk about the Dodgers minor league system, the action over the weekend. There was a lot of great action in the Dodgers minor league system over the weekend, starting with AAA Oklahoma City. They actually went two and four last week, but they did win the last two out of the three games in the series with Salt Lake to move the record to 75 and 43. Landon Knack, you're seeing right here the East Tennessee State alum. What a performance he had Friday evening. He gave up just one run, seven innings, had four strikeouts featuring four pitches. You know, his four pitches are so good that sometimes Trackman actually registers them as five because of the slider that he throws. When it goes smaller, it gets listed as a cutter from time to time, but it is only four pitches, but Landon Knack is skilled enough to shape his different pitches differently to even uh, fool the track man every now and then. That's how skilled he is. Plus, he throws, he throws strikes with all four pitches as well. So a good outing for Landon Knack. Good curve, good change. ERA 307 on the year. Whip 114, 97 strikeouts, just 27 walks on the year. So Landon Knack talked to him. The interview has been posted for a couple of weeks. He mentioned that he is very motivated, you know, kind of has a chip on his shoulder because he felt like he was kind of the first. Michael Bush did not hit a home run in his first 45 at-bats this year. First 45 at-bats. As a matter of fact, after he hit his first one, he kind of joked around and he was wondering if he was ever going to hit one. So 45 at-bats. But since he's hit 24 in 302 at-bats, that means that since those 45 at-bats have expired, since then, he has averaged hitting one home run every 12 and a half at-bats. And during that span, he's 96 for 302, 317. So Michael Bush hitting home runs, one home run every 12 at-bats since his first 45 at-bats, hitting three. So my man Drew Avens has been playing some fantastic baseball. He had three hits on Friday evening. He scored three times for Triple A Oklahoma City, and he has three multi-hit games in his last four played, and he had hits in four games in a row and seven of his last eight as of Friday whenever I did my post on him that you're seeing here. He's hitting 324 so far in August this month. His OPS this month is 757. On the pitching side, that cutter slash slider pitch of Tyler Sear plus the riding four seam that you just saw, that was 94.3 what you saw. That's Michael Bush right there making that catch. And his four seam had 41 inches of vertical drop to it at the highest. At one of his four seams that he threw, that's the maximum, was a 41-inch vert on that pitch. That's amazing, especially at 94.3. You can see that downward movement to it. And he landed all four cutters that he threw on Friday evening. His cutter averaged 91 miles an hour. There's that slider. That's more of a slider, but he has the slider that he also has 
a smaller shaped cutter pitch that he threw around 91 miles an hour. He landed all of them for strikes, and he has yet to give up. A Alec Gamboa, the young man out of Madera, California, Madtown. He threw a scoreless inning Saturday night, gave up no hits. It'll lower his ERA down to, ready for this, 208 for Alec Gamboa. His whip is just 108. His average against is just 162. He touched 94.5 on the fastball. He induced weak contact with his slider. So Alec Gamboa, well, I tell you what, I, I've said this a couple times about him. Talk to him back and forth in the offseason. His number one comment about this year is this needs to be a good year for me. He dedicated himself to, you know, this kind of being where the rubber meet the, met the road for him. And he's taken that as a challenge. You know, his three-sport background, he was that H-back type in football. He was an all-state wrestler, tremendous wrestler, one of the best three-sport uh, uh, three athletes ever to come out of the Madera, California area. So when you challenge yourself like that, he loves those types of challenges. Hey, this is where the rubber's going to meet the road for me. Might be my last shot. Might be the, you know, the, the year that if I pitch well, I make the major leagues. It's that kind of teeter-totter. That's the type of challenge. Hey, here's Shelby Miller and his split change. That's a very good pitch. You know, we've seen a lot of those splitters. There's a good fastball right there, though, a four-seam fastball. What you're seeing right here is Shelby Miller's second rehab outing with Triple A Oklahoma City. It was easily his best. His first one, he gave up three runs. But, hey, I said this even with Ryan Pepio. I always say this in rehab outings. You know, these guys aren't throwing to scouting reports. They're just trying to get their mix together. They're just trying to get their arms loose, and they're trying to stay healthy. So a lot of times, you just can't look at results in a rehab outing. But having said that, he did give up three runs in his first rehab outing. Very good here in his second rehab outing Saturday night. He touched 93.7. He threw seven four seams, all for strikes, and that set up the three split changes that he threw, and he landed. What more can you say about Kyle Hurt as far as how the, the clip that he's been able to strike guys out at? Saturday night, he was the bulk pitcher. He went four innings for Triple A Oklahoma City. He gave up just one run, eight strikeouts, touched 97.4. This guy, Kyle Hurt, has some of the best stuff of any prospect in any organization out there, when the ball is in the strike zone for him, he is just simply electric. Kyle Hurd, and he has been striking guys out at an unparalleled clip so far at the minor league level. Okay, so he touched 97.4. He threw both his cutter and his curve for a strike 50% or better. So we know about the velo. What about the secondaries? When he's landing two different secondaries at a 50% clip or better, nobody is going to hit Kyle Hurd at least at a consistent basis, and the Bees were not able to Saturday night. And also, beyond the strikeouts, Kyle, uh, Kyle Hurd's cutter, his curve, and his slider induced weak contact as well. On the year, Kyle Hurt, ERA 375. So I said, hey, he's been striking a lot of guys out. 131 strikeouts, 77 innings. So Kyle Hurt, the young man, from the San Diego area, Southern California boy. Super excited to know his entire family. Excited about him being in the Dodgers organization. This is Ken Giles right here. He threw a scoreless inning Saturday night. He has given up just one run in his four outings this month in August. Ken Giles again. That spans just 3.2 innings, so a small sample size. But hey, it's the only sample size he's been given. And he's done a good job with it. He has six strikeouts in those 3.2 innings. But he does have five walks. So the deal with him, you know, just like Jimmy Nelson, just like a lot of these guys that are on rehab, got to get the baseball in the strike zone more consistently than five walks and 3.2 innings if you want to get called up to the talented bullpen that the Dodgers have. So you wouldn't think that Giles is threatening the Major League roster, you know, uh, imminently with the five walks, but who knows, in just 3.2 innings. But we do know this is a talented young man. Sinker was 94.9. 21 and 13 on the movement, 21 inches of vert, 13 on the horizontal, and it was in the strike zone 51% of the time. Slider had 41 inches of vertical, but just was in this good look at left-handed pitcher out of Scattacoke County, or Scattacoke, New York. That would be John Rooney through his four scoreless outing Saturday night. John Rooney has been throwing as well as he ever had. Hey, you know, we mentioned James Altman. He said, you know, before the results started turning around for him in this last good patch that he's had, he said, hey, I was hitting the ball and I felt good for weeks ahead of the success actually following that. Talked to John Rooney a couple weeks ago. He said, hey, this is the best that 
that the ball has come out of my hand maybe ever. But, you know, hey, in the PCL, the results don't always follow that. You can get ambushed or a ball can get in the air and just never seem to come down on some of those altitudes. So John Rooney, he's throwing the ball very, very, very well right now. The results are just now showing it, and that's not always easy, like I said, in the Pacific Coast League. He threw six cutters Saturday night, four for strikes. 50% or better in the zone with all of his pitches, and he was 94.3 on the velo, being that tall left-handed the extent. Miguel Vargas had 102.2 mile an hour double on Saturday. You know, Miguel Vargas, we all know, can hit AAA pitching in his sleep. What you want to know is how hard is he hitting the baseball. So good to see the exit velos. And then Emmett Sheehan went four scoreless with five strikeouts, just one walk, one hit. We know the Dodgers love that piggyback system. That's exactly what he was on. He came in and was the bulk pitcher, and he's allowed just one run in eight innings in his two outings with Oklahoma City. He has 11 strikeouts, just three walks. He touched 98.2. Now listen to these metrics. These are impressive. 98.2 on the velo, 19 inches of vertical drop, 11 horizontal. So 19 vertical, 11 horizontal on a 98.2 mile an hour pitch. That is absolutely incredible. And his vertical movements on all of his pitches, the vertical movement on his changeup, 39 inches, 35 inches of vert on his cutter, 39 on his slider, or his curve, excuse me, and then also 39 on his slider as well. So not only the big velo, not only the three-quarter arm slot, not only good extension, but also great movement to his pitches. And Emmett Sheehan's been able to do that while staying in the strike zone as just the one walk would show. It was a good week for the AA Tulsa Drillers who entered last week having just a 500 record. Hey, they went 4 and 2 in Frisco and they improved their record on the season to now two games over 500 58 and 56. Who you're seeing right here is Yusniel Diaz. Yusniel Diaz has been one of the hottest young men on the planet. He has been the guy that really has carried this offense here in this down patch for the drillers that they've been in for about the last month. But using El Diaz, we mentioned that he was in that trade that uh, in the trade that that brought Manny Machado to the Dodgers. So really, hey, you got Manny Machado, then you also got using El Diaz back. So that was a win-win. But using El Diaz, as of late, man, he has been hitting home runs. He's been hitting the baseball for average. He's been a guy that has brought a lot of energy. This is home run number 11 that you're seeing here. It was towering as you saw. It was very impressive. And he's hitting 396 so far in August OPS 12-12. He has hits in 15 of the last 16 games, 18 of the last 20. And in that international community within the Dodgers, I talked to Eddie Leonard about this. He is a guy that they, uh, most of them, I'm telling you, if you spend any time around River Ryan, young man who uh, out of North Carolina went to UNC Pembroke due to some injury issues and his high school career, brother Ryder Ryan, congratulations to him. Very successful Major League debut the other day. So, hey, this Ryder Ryan and his family, very successful. His dad was a professional baseball player, same as his uncle. And I'm telling you, when he carries himself, there's that good little cutter slash slider pitch. Good play by Cody Hosey. He carries himself like a major leaguer. He thinks like a major leaguer. It's just a matter of time before he gets to the major leagues. It would be shocking if he didn't. This dude has a huge arm. Uh, I, like I said, a mentality that is absolutely big league. That total amount of confidence, just a great aura to him, big time aura to him. But it's not arrogance. It's it's an aura that just makes you realize really realize that he believes that he is a big time, big caliber major league type pitcher. Had a great outing. Over the weekend, went five innings, gave up no earned runs, just four strikeouts on Friday night. Just one walk, his ERA on the year is just 308, and he has 88 strikeouts and 88 and 82 innings. Let me say that again. Well, surely you didn't think we'd get through a double-A Tulsa segment without talking about Austin Gothier. Hey, they say you make your own luck. Austin had three of those hits on Friday evening. He went. He had three hits, and they were all like, there's the first one, here's the second one. About a six-hopper through the infield. And the third one that you're getting ready to see here in a minute is just like it. But, hey, they say you make your own luck, and as good as he's hit, as much contact as he's made, 
He straight. He has actually walked more than he struck out. There's the third hit. You make your own luck. This is also the 31st multi-hit game of the year for Austin Gothier. That just goes to show how good he's been. And Gothier is hitting 320 overall between the two levels of high A Great Lakes and double A Tulsa. OPS 936, and he's not letting up. He's hitting 346 so far. Emanuel Vargas had two hits and three RBIs for Tulsa on Saturday in a much-needed win for double A Tulsa because the Drillers, man, they're grinding really hard right now. Again, two games over 500. Vargas hit his 25th double and has five multi-hit games in his last six, so that's fantastic. Emanuel Vargas, Usniel Diaz, Austin Gothier, they have all been just simply fantastic offensively. So, Emanuel Vargas, good to see him continue to hit the baseball. Five multi-hit games in the last six. He's 11 for his last 27. Nick Frasso gave a very, very, very good start on Sunday. Went four innings. He struck out five. He walked just three, gave up just four hits and one run. That's a good outing for Nick Frasso. He's allowed just one run in his last two starts. That totals nine innings and has recorded ten strikeouts in those nine innings and those two starts. And so he has been pitching very well. Nick Frasso, his ERA for the year, 391. He has 94 Ks. 73. You know, I mentioned that professional baseball players are so good that it's hard to stick out for anything. You know, and that, um, that's a good slider there, but that's not the big breaking ball that Trevor Bencourt has. So when something does stick out in the field, you know it is something that is really, really good. I'm just telling you, Trevor Bencourt's breaking ball, that thing sticks out. It is a great pitch. That's a good little slider there. That's a smaller one. He has a bigger breaking ball he can throw to to get really depth on it and get a strikeout out of it. But Trevor Budencourt went 1.2 scoreless yesterday on Sunday. He gave up just one hit, no walks. He makes the other team earn everything. Hey, it's the age-old formula, make the other team earn everything. No freebies, and then pitch backwards. Ricky Venasco has not allowed an earned run since July 8th. You know, he was with the Rangers, and he, he came over in the offseason to the Dodgers. So being back in Frisco, who is the AA affiliate's Ricky Venasco has not allowed an earned run since July 8th, which was just his second outing when he came over with Tulsa, you know. Hey, Venasco is back in Frisco. He was with the Rangers last year that you can see right there. He probably one of his teammates that he played with last year. Him, Kevin Gowdy, Josh Stowers, all with the Rangers last year, all came to the Dodgers this year. So, you know, Venasco had a little bit of extra incentive pitching, you know, against his former uh, franchise that let him go and let him come to the Dodgers. And he has been pitching simply fantastic. Has not allowed an earned run since his second outing with the with the Drillers, which was July 8th. Like I said just a minute ago, he's gone 12 outings in a row, scored us, and he has 21 strikeouts, 13.2 innings in that time. His average against with Tulsa is just 169. His whip is 086. His ERA is just 165. Diego Cartaya is trying to create some momentum to finish his season here in 2023. He had three hits, including his 10th double, and has hits in three of his last four games. He had three hits yesterday for Double A Tulsa. Cartaya is six for his last 16 and 10 for his last 33 and he has four home runs and four doubles already this month. It would be great to see Diego Cartaya finish very strong a 2023 that otherwise has been disappointing for him. Often mentioned that uh, Ricky Venasco, Kevin Gowdy, and Josh Stowers, a young man you're seeing here, all played for Frisco last year. Josh Stowers had to feel good to go back to that home run terrace that he played at last year and hit a home run against his former teammates. This was loud in the sixth inning yesterday. So Justin Robleski got the weekend started right for the high A Great Lakes Loons. He hit 99, according to the play-by-play -play broadcaster for Lansing. Now, sometimes these radar guns at the high level, especially on the road, you have no idea exactly how you know accurate they are. But hey, 99, he's hit 98 before, so good for him. So hey, even if it's not a legitimate 99, which I'm not saying it's not, but you never know with these radar guns. That means you know at the very least, great velo for left-hander Justin Robleski. Went to Clemson out of high school and then uh, transferred to a JUCO. Ended up at Oklahoma State. Had Tommy John in 2021. So you're talking about 2020, canceling the college season, 2021. Then he had the Tommy John. Didn't throw for about two years. Got ramped back up last year. Didn't throw quite a, uh, very much. And so coming into this year, you know, this is the big year for him. Worried about him wearing down just a touch. You know, not having thrown a whole lot in the last couple, two to three years. But, hey, man, he's just getting 
getting stronger as the 99 on the radar gun there in Lansing would show. He went three innings, gave up just one run. ERA on the year is down to 303. His ERA this month in August is just 225. It was 347 in July, and it was 109 in June. Griffin Lockwood Powell, how about him? He hit for a cycle on Saturday. It was absolutely amazing. Actually, I think he hit for the cycle on Friday evening, and he hit a go-ahead home run to give his team the lead and to complete the cycle. That's James Alvin type stuff. You know, give your team the lead, the go-ahead hit on a home run that also completed the cycle for him. That was absolutely fantastic. Griffin Lockwood Powell has hits in six games in a row, and that's hits in 10 of his last 11. So Griffin Lockwood Powell, what a special moment, completing the cycle Friday evening. Then he had another great game on Sunday, the former Central. There's that home run. That's the home run that gave the Loons the win, the lead and the win, and the cycle for the young Central Michigan Chippewa. I actually lied. That's actually the triple he hit. We're going to see the home run here in a minute if I can hang on. But the Central Michigan Chippewa, Griffin Lockwood Powell, that loves to use the middle of the field, is starting to show a lot more power as of late. There's Daniel Nava right there. Here is the home run right there. That's the one that did it. That's the one that gave the Loons the lead. That's Michael Hobbs, very similar to Trevor Betancourt, that huge, huge breaking ball. California area type guy, and he also has a good four seam to go with it, and super, super, super competitive. You're looking at his sixth save on Friday evening. You know, Griffin Lockwood Powell hit that home run to complete the cycle, to give the Loons the lead, and you know, to go ahead. Can you imagine coming in after that and blowing that lead? That would be just unbelievable. Kind of reminds you of the Johnny DeLuca situation where he hit his first major league home run yeah, and then evan right phillips there. couldn't keep the lead how big of a, a downer that was obviously we all love evan phillips i didn't mean it from that perspective but that would be a pretty big downer if the guy just hit a home run to complete the cycle to give your team the lead set your team up in position to win and then you don't come in and get the job done and you give up the lead and you lose the game that would have been a downer so that was a difficult situation that michael hobbs came into but man he cruised right through he did a fantastic job hobbs his ERA is down to 314. He has 53 Ks, 43 innings. His ERA since the beginning of June is just 270, and it is 150 this month. So great job, Michael. Hey, Kenneth Betancourt, a young man that was just buried in Rancho Cucamonga for so long. He's been playing great offense for Great Lakes. He had three hits for the Loons to increase his average to 279. He has back-to-back -back multi hit games, and he has five for his last eight. He has hits in four games in a row, so great to see Kenneth Betancourt continue to grind one of the most well-liked. Alex Freeland, a young man I talk about with all of his talent all the time. He had two hits for the Loons. He is on base three times on Saturday. And he has three multi-hit games in a row. And his last four, and he has eight for his last 16. So the young man out of the UCF, out of UCF, the University of Central Florida, the Knights. Boy, he is super talented, and he had a really good game on Saturday. Line drive, right field, base hit, just like... 1-0 pitch. <clears throat> Franklin De La Paz had a good outing for High A Great Lakes. He went scoreless in his one inning Saturday night. He struck out two. De La Paz got his first win. Surely he didn't think we were going to get through this Great Lakes session without talking about Yaner Fernandez, one of my favorite young, you know, I call him just kind of a grub worm. Just one of those really tough, gritty, just extremely tough dudes, very talented. He just loves playing the game of baseball. He had two hits for Great Lakes on Sunday afternoon, which is the second multi-hit game in a row, fifth game in a row, with a hit in eighth of his last nine. So Yaner Fernandez is hitting 343 so far in August. Having a great Friday month, another one of those guys, Scoreless just tough as nails. Loon. You know, hey, being a catcher, of course, early. he is versatile. He plays more than just side, catcher. Twisting, but twisting, being a catcher, when you see them actually get stronger as the season goes Young on, scores. that's a pretty good indication Freeland of how tough mentally RBI and physically they are. Ronan Kopp has been a starter. He's Hitch. been a high leverage late Indian inning reliever, and right on side. Sunday he was Carlos a middle Amaya. reliever. He went one in the third innings, strike one. scored us with three strikeouts, just one walk and one hit. He is not on an innings All countdown. The the right this side. is just something that the Loons Here's are doing to get him Swing in more games, to be able to touch and two. affect more games Back because he is so talented. And he went one and a third inning, scored us with three strikeouts, just one walk and one hit. Intimidating frame, as you can see here. Incredible extension. It's like he's just handing the ball to the catcher. On him. Big stuff. Break even and his from ERA Pat. is just 308 on the year. 96 the the strikeouts, 64.1 innings. Go back so to Ronan Cobb. Keep up Cobb the great work. Six and three innings. Aquid Powell, they're up six to three. 
Alters, pitch up. Benoni Robles threw his four Alters, scoreless now, outing today, or yesterday, I should say, for right the second, Sunday, I should say, for the Great Lakes. Loons and has eight Fernandez strikeouts in 4.2 innings. Lugs, two three walks, eight, only three pitch. walks so far in August in compared to those eight one. strikeouts. ERA on the year is just 3.67. His whip for this year is 111. Average against 152, 42 Ks, 16 walks, 27 innings. He has turned the corner this summer, one. still needs to throw more strikes like every single pitcher in the Dodgers right. minor league system. I mean, you could say that literally times. about every Seems single one of them. Need to throw more strikes. They all need to throw more one strikes. But Benoni Robles down, has really turned right the corner field, up this summer. And he will come just in front of the warning track, makes the catch. So, a pitch home. We have a ton of great Rancho Cucamonga Quakes there in Viserys, so they had video. So I have a ton of video to show you on the Rancho Cucamonga Quakes on a whole bunch of different guys you've probably never seen. You probably have seen Jared Karras that you're seeing here, but he had a really good performance. Got the weekend started off right on Friday night. He went five innings scoreless. He struck out four, walked just two, four-pitch mix for Jared Karras. Good outing. He gave up just four hits. He's given up just one uh, hit or one run in his last nine innings, and he has 11 strikeouts in that span. His ERA, Jared Karras, 431 on the year, 71 K, 64.2 innings. So Jared Karras, great outing Friday night for the Rancho Cucamonga Quakes. First, and they still trail by one. Top of the third coming up. You're listening to and watching. Well, it was Jared Karras on Friday. It was Chris Campos on Saturday. I had a chance to talk to Chris Campos in the off season. He mentioned that of all the guys that he worked out with, and he worked the most with Jared Karras. They're good friends. They help each other a ton. So it was really cool to see those two have really good back-to-back -back performances. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think Jared went out and had a great performance, and Chris wanted to go out there and match that. They fed off of each other's positive energy. Okay, so Saturday, a really, really good performance for Chris Campos. Explosive. You see that good cutter slash slider pitch. He had eight strikeouts in four innings. Like I said, that big time slider gave up just one run and two hits he struck out six in a row at one point so the young man who was a shortstop at st mary's played shortstop on some of the teams that michael hobbs was the closer of that's kind of a cool deal he was a shortstop mainly in college moved to a pitcher in professional ranks and he is really catching his stride as a pitcher so great job chris campo oh one is that's the oh two swung on and missed Venezuelan catcher Jesus Galiz had an eight RBI right game this past week. He is a very talented corner, young man. He had three hits for Rancho it. on it Saturday, eight low. RBIs. He, he had his 12th ball. double and seventh home run of 2023. Oh, no, so sorry. not only he is he racking up a double. bunch of hits recently, Jesus Galiz, he's also starting to hit home runs. There you see one right there, foul. So he hit one very foul right here, but very far. And then about two pitches later, he hit the home run instead. So he actually hit two home runs. One foul and one fair in the same at bat. So he's starting to get the ball in the air, starting to hit the ball with power, which is exciting because he has a great hit tool. You know, just one of the hardest workers. Great young man. Had a chance to talk to him on two different occasions. He has multi hit games in two of his last three. So great job, Jesus Galiz. 0 2. Breaking ball popped up. Josue De Paula had two hits for Rancho on Sunday to move his average up to 281. He has hits in 10 games and 10 of his last 11 games, and he's going to just wear, you know, he's that guy. We mentioned the power. He's not necessarily getting the ball in the air as much. You know, the Dodgers like the ball in the air, and they use analytics to say, hey, get the ball in the air. That's where the home runs are at. The average will go higher. Okay, he's not necessarily getting the ball in the air. He's hitting those low-line drives. And he's just he's wearing hard. out that left center to right center field gap. So I think his power is pitch. going to manifest itself Lined right there. The that left the center field gap I'm talking about. Field. Mainly and like that. It's going to be a lot of doubles to left center. A lot of doubles to right first. center. A, a lot of base hits to the middle of the field. And then eventually he's going to get the ball in the air. You know, until he gets a little bit older. But Jose De Paula, great job. This is Fran Castro. A good look at him. I'm not sure if I've covered him on Dodgers Daily before. If I have, I don't remember it. But he got the win for Rancho on Saturday, going two scoreless. He struck out two, gave up just one run. This was Castro's third scoreless outing in his last four. Look at that little cutter pitch. That's a good pitch. And his ERA this month is just 150. There's the four seam up in the zone. You've seen the little cutter pitch. And there it is again, more of a slider type pitch for the swing and miss. So good look at Fran Castro.
This is Jonathan Edwards, young man out of Georgia Southern. I say it every time. Big, tall, lanky, very competitive. Big stuff. Has not been able to find the strike zone consistently enough to have consistent success yet at the professional level. Tell you what, he might be putting it together. This is easily the best he's pitched in his entire career as of late. He was hitting 97 on Sunday, and he's gone scoreless in six outings in a row. That spans 11.2 innings, and he has 15 strikeouts in those 11.2 innings. So, like I said, if Jonathan Edwards can just do that right there, you see the live arm, 97. The live arm, the tall extension, so that 97 to the hitter probably looks like 101, 102. And so, hey, if he can just command the strike zone consistently, the ball is in his court because Jonathan Edwards is very, very talented. So here is 10th round draft pick out of Sacred Heart just from this last draft, 2023. This is Sam Mongelli. By the way, go Big Red. The Sacred Heart there had three hits for Rancho on Sunday, an RBI, and was on base four times. Shortstop type prospect. He played right field on Sunday, but hey, you know, one of those guys, again, if you can play shortstop, the Dodgers figure you can play anywhere on the field. That's kind of what they're doing with him. Played shortstop mainly for the Pioneers there at Sacred Heart, where he hit 402 with an OPS of 1238 this past season in 2023 before he got drafted, and he had 20 home runs. So not only did he hit 402, he had 20 home runs. In 2023, before he got drafted by the Dodgers, so a great combination of power, but also a great hitter for a guy that's also very versatile, that can play the outfield and the infield, specifically shortstop. So there is a good look at 2023 10th round draft pick out of Sacred Heart for the Rancho Cucamonga Quakes and the Dodgers, San Mangeli. Well, surely you didn't think I wouldn't cover Theron Lorenzo. You know, hey, there's some staples and all of them. We talk about Austin Gothier. Seems like every single time we do double A, you know, Yainer Fernandez for Great Lakes. Theron Lorenzo has become that guy for the Rancho Cucamonga Quakes. He had two hits for Rancho and RBI was on base three times and scored twice. Lorenzo has three multi-hit games in his last six and is nine for his last 21 with five doubles, two home runs, six RBI. So Theron Lorenzo. Young man that can catch, do a little bit of everything. Sweet swing right there. Is playing very good baseball. Rained on Cone had two hits and a couple of ribeye steaks for the Quakes on Sunday. He has hits in three games in a row. A row Luis Rodriguez had two hits as well and two RBIs, which is his third multi-hit game in a row. And then Madison Jeffrey, hey, he got himself in trouble. He got the bases loaded, then he worked himself out of it, which was really cool. So that's going to bring us to our next guy that you but that we've never covered here. Our next two, we're going to finish with Noah Rune, who was a 2023 12th round draft pick in this last draft. We're going to show him. I think you're going to like it. Submariner and Ronaldo Yeen will finish with him. So here is a good look at the submarining right here, 12th round draft pick, 2023 draft, Noah Rune, submariner out of Tyler Juco. And I am very familiar with that Juco program. If you pitch at Tyler Juco, you are very, very good. He threw a scoreless inning for Rancho. He's gone scoreless in four of his five outings since being drafted. So, hey, Noah Rune, a hey, live arm, good velo there, good submarine. There's a good look at him from the open face. Watch the submarine pitch. Very competitive young man, too. Love that pitch. And look at that arm side movement to it. Let me back that up just a touch. Let you see that again. Watch that thing come back into a righty. That's a really good pitch. So I wanted to give you a good look at the submarine and look at the confidence from Noah Rune. And wanted to finish with the big right arm of Ronaldo Yeen. He threw a scoreless inning for Rancho with his second scoreless outing in a row. Seventh of his last eight, he has 10 strikeouts in five innings so far this month. Ronaldo Yeen, who has reached 100 miles an hour on multiple occasions, threw again, uh, threw well again on Sunday. It was a rainy day there in Visalia, you know, with all of the hurricane stuff in the Southern California. They still, they didn't cancel their game in Visalia. They played it. And so, Ronaldo Yeen, he finished off the day right for Rancho. Uh, coming in and throwing bullets again. Ten strikeouts in five innings so far this month in August. Ronaldo Yee.